Yeah, my name's Nadim Mazin, as you said. I have a background uh, as a graduate of MIT and a uh, former researcher at the MIT Media Lab. Um, I have uh, spent many years in the software design and development business, working with big name brands, uh, Samsung, Revlon, McGraw-Hill Publishing in the US, many others. Um, I went on to actually run for and win elected office, so I became a politician in the city of, uh, of Cambridge, which is where MIT and Harvard are housed, so I got to work with the presidents of the universities and high-level executives there. Wow. I oversaw a budget of two to three billion dollars, wow. and I, in public impact, tech investment, other things, and I uh, stepped down and retired uh, very kind of early from a nice and interesting uh, uh, job there to form this team and assemble really what I think is, is the best team for, uh, for what we're doing, the, the, the future of how human beings connect online and in the future of Web3. All right, Mr. James, would you like to introduce about yourself? Yeah, uh, so my name is James Moffat. I have a background in computer science, spent about 10 years in software engineering and product design for large corporations. About three years ago, I re-entered academia. I spent a year lecturing uh, internationally as a Fulbright scholar in privacy and user experience design for large data systems. I went back to do graduate studies at the Harvard School, Graduate School of Design. Uh, and did some research time at the Media Lab as well. Uh, I was focused on the intersection of machine learning, user experience, and privacy in large systems, and uh, got involved with Nadim in, during my studies, and this project, the Fabric Project, sort of influenced my thesis, which I submitted to Harvard last year. I've been working on this project ever since. Fabric is a people protocol. It's like HTTP, which is used to connect websites and you, any type of data on the internet, really, uh, except for people, connecting people. And we look at social media today, social networking services, especially in the West, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and they own the data, they own your data, they view your chats, they sell you ads and then take the money, and they own the interface. They're fully vertically integrated from your data through the interface down into the experience, and we want to flip the model. Mm -hmm. In a people protocol, you own your data. You own your messages, your private details. You own your relationship with developers, and they bring you the apps that show you the social network, show you the social graph. Mm -hmm. When you go from app to app, you bring your messages and your posts and analytics about you with you because you own it. And when the developer can access this with your permission, the developers can compete to show you the most value. Today on social networks in the West, you are the product. You are not the valued client. The valued client is the advertiser. You are just the engine that keeps the advertising system going. You are the battery. You are the fuel. And when you are used like this, there are perverse incentives, what we call perverse incentives. The network should be showing you the best content. Instead, they show you the content that makes you scroll the longest, makes you watch the most ads. They should be showing you the most job opportunities, but instead it's in their interest on LinkedIn, for example, to make the ad, uh, the, the job poster, pay for more job ads. So I won't fill the ad, I won't fill the job, I won't connect the people with the job they want because the longer that this person pays for the ad, the better for the platform. When we flip this model, starting with a protocol and going up to new types and innovative types of uh, social networking dApps, we create a, a, a very seamless and robust ecosystem mm -hmm. that is familiar to users of Facebook, familiar to users of, of YouTube and Instagram, but has so much more power because the user is in the driver's seat. Yeah, part of the reason that we decided to attack the social space is because there's a sort of paradox. And the problem is that you need a large number of users to have a good product. But once you have a large number of users, the incentive is to not change. The incentive is to not innovate. Not prototype. So, for example, if you look at you know, Facebook's interface from 2013, it is completely indistinguishable from today. You cannot tell one difference. And so the problem is you need so many users to give a good experience, but once you have that one good experience, you can't change it. Because your investors are saying, no, I make money, I like this, don't change it. And so we're trying to figure out how we can build uh, infrastructure for social products that allows for innovation and rapid prototyping. And competition, natural competition. 
So delegated proof of value is similar to, it's an evolution of delegated proof of stake. So users elect delegates who do the consensus work and the delegates campaign for the votes of users by offering new services to the network. So the delegates are able to shape the future of the network by offering services that users then vote on. And the voting power under DPoS, for example, is based on your coin stake. It's how many coins you have. So the rich people effectively control the network in DPoS. However, uh, in DPoV, what we saw in several networks, for example, you know, Steam has a very sort of uh, coin-centric governance model. And the problem is that at that point, the preferences of a handful of whales at the beginning of the network tend to describe how the network works forever. And it's, it's problematic because the user experience is not innovative, it, that you can't do rapid prototyping and it causes structure. Also the rules, the governance, many other issues. Sure, and so what we saw was that you needed some way to figure out who is participating and who is actually contributing value. And there are other um, models for this like uh, proof of authority or proof of contribution, and these are interesting but incomplete. And they're interesting because they do take into account behavior of users, but they're incomplete because they assume that all behavior is good. They assume that the more you do, the more content you post, the better. However, we know, uh, especially in the US from the last election cycle, that not all content is good content. And just because a piece of content is read widely or it spreads quickly is not necessarily good. In fact, if it's a false rumor or another bad piece of content, the more it's read and the faster it's spread, the worse it is. So part of our team members' research at MIT and Harvard has been about what you can learn from looking at a network at the high level. Can you actually see, uh, do, do messages that are, say, false rumors, do they have a different signature as they move through the network? Do nodes uh, have a different signature if they're more likely to spread false rumors? So without invading people's privacy, at a very high level of abstraction, can you look at the network and say, this content is high quality, and this person is more likely to spread high quality content than low quality content? And we found that we can. And so that's the, the core of DPOV, is basically every user has a network shape to their behavior. And there's a range of shapes, possible shapes that you can have, and we're learning actively in our test net right now about how to distinguish the good shapes from the bad shapes. And so we're able to reward behavior based on the value that you contribute, and you get more of a vote in the future of the network. And just to, to sum this up, DPOV mm -hmm. essentially marries the best of DPoS, uh, so staking, governance, service provision, processing. Um, through the staking model that essentially rewards wealth, mm. but also has aspects that reward not just a proof of contribution, but the nature of the contribution and the shape of the contribution, not just the volume. Anyone can spam a bunch of volume or you know, create a spam bot network, but we actually think it's really important to protect the reputation of individuals within the network and to essentially um, control for or to promote good behavior and reputable behavior. We actually have two buckets. We look at inspiration and competition. So, you know, Kakao Talk and WeChat, we really see as inspirational. Mm -hmm. They, you have payments, you have uh, mini apps, you have all kinds of things, especially WeChat. We just ha have been very impressed. But it's still owned by a central company, and that company still kind of owns your data, looks at your messages, and probably sells this data, or at least is able to sell this data. Um, this company still has perverse incentives because the user is not in control. These companies are way ahead of companies in the West where we are most active. Fabric is a, a protocol for the entire globe, but in the West there's over a billion people who can't make payments online. Um, people still use, are using Kakao Pay here. They assume that this is the same in the US. We use a card everywhere. Almost 100% of people are using a card everywhere, you know, despite Samsung Pay and Apple Pay and all of this stuff. So we, we need a protocol that has seamless payments, micropayments, smart payments and contracts, connects people. And so when we look at competitors like Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, we really see an opportunity to come up and provide what people want. People want to be in control. They want to have a trusted community, not a community of corporations. This is what people are rebelling against in the West. 
and they want to have a solution that they know is going to be feasible and robust uh, and one that is shared by a, you know, a large community. I think even we can look at um, competitors in the blockchain space. For example, the two largest social products are Steemit and Minds, mm -hmm. but they're still fundamentally similar to the previous incumbent projects. So, you know, when Steemit shows you a feed, right, it's still the feed that Steemit wants you to see, right? There's no competition between feeds. Developers can't go on Steemit and build a hundred different feeds that all compete together in a marketplace to deliver value to users. Same thing with mines. So that's sort of what sets Fabric apart is that we're trying to build this infrastructure, this protocol that allows developers to do those social products in a way that actually compete instead of the siloed yeah. uh, networks that you see even in new blockchain projects. In the, social, in the social economy of the future, the problem won't be having too little data. On, on Facebook right now, you can only have 5,000 friends. Mm -hmm. Or uh, in Twitter, you have to purchase Firehose in order to see the whole network, mm -hmm. right? So the problem is having too little data. In the social economy that we're building, the problem will be having too much data. You'll have access to everything. And the question is, what do you want to pay for? What do you want to take for free? And how can developers help you to look through all of this data and get what's truly valuable? Because right now, we have a social network of billions of people. I don't mean Facebook's network or Twitter's network. I mean your network, my network, the personal connections we have in reality. And we see this network through a tiny keyhole that is controlled by someone else tiny keyhole right here. You're going to see these friends or these friends. What's over there? I can't see it, right? And so uh, the, the problem of these competitors in the incumbent markets, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, whatever, are, are almost mirrored in the new blockchain economy mm -hmm. because you still are only seeing the network through a keyhole created. Now it's more democratic, but the keyhole is still very small. And it's still been created by initial authors within the community and has not evolved at the same pace as the, as the uh, scale of the data. Yeah, I mean, uh, having a good governance model is absolutely essential. And there are things that governance, uh, that we're learning about governance in blockchain. And however, you need competition and you need a marketplace and you need to be able to have developers coming up with new ideas that compete against one another in order to innovate, in order to have something new. And that's what we just don't see in blockchain social products, much less in non-blockchain social products. Yeah, I think, um, interestingly, Libra, I think, is going to be very good for Fabric mm -hmm. and probably not that great for Facebook. So the reason that I say that is because uh, it's introducing people in the West to blockchain and to cryptocurrency, which is great. Mm -hmm. And they're asking questions, you know, what, what do these payments allow me to do? Why is this important? What is blockchain? What is decentralization? Do I want Facebook in charge? And, and, and when, <laughs> when, you, when you ask those questions, like, do I, do I want cryptocurrency payments that allow me to instantly send money to my friends in whatever amount I want? Yes, obviously, I want mm -hmm. that. Um, what is decentralization? What does it mean to not have all of our sensitive data collected in one spot where it can leak or be misused? Yes, that sounds great. Do I want Facebook to be in charge of this? No, Facebook does not have the trust of the users and they don't have the trust of the regulators. And the either. Libra coin consortium does not have the trust. It's not like they took the most trusted people in the US. They yeah. took some of the least trusted. Names yeah, it's, in the it's US. not like trusted institutions or nonprofits or universities. No, it's, it's some of the corporations that have the least amount of trust in the entire country. Mm -hmm. You know, this is Facebook and this is MasterCard. And Uber. And Uber. <laughs> Just like one of the most hated companies by users. And so uh, what, what we think is that uh, this is really great. It's putting the attention right where it belongs. Mm -hmm. It's getting people to ask the right questions. Uh, but for example, uh, a letter was just created by two US Congress people that asked Facebook to stop uh, development on Libra right now mm -hmm. because they don't trust them. And so we think that the questions are absolutely correct and we would love to, for people to look for those answers because we're going to be waiting right there. So, so we're kind of building some of the default products. We have grants out um, that we're, we're building with developers in our ecosystem where they are coming to us to build products cooperatively or, or independently. And there will be a lot of incentives for developers who aren't in our granting system to, to be building in this, in this ecosystem. 
So we want to make sure that all the familiar features people know and love are there. You can browse for cat photos. You can have a photo-like uh, feed like Instagram. You can have a video-like feed like YouTube. We need to make sure that these things are part of a seamless experience. You can even switch between screens uh, feeds by swiping right and left. Why didn't anyone think of swiping feeds? We're only swiping dates in the West, but we, can <laughs> we should be swiping feeds right, to get that out of the way and get to the next one. Uh, and we're creating some competition between feeds, but we're also creating entirely new products as part of our de default deployment. Mm -hmm. And so this includes discovery rewards, which I think James would love to describe. It includes many other things that no one has ever imagined as part of the social context. And that's just the first default launch with our, in with our third party developers. Eventually, you want to see something like the App Store, you know, the, the, the uh, Google Play Store or the iOS App Store. You want to see something where there's a robust set of developers that are trending, mm -hmm. that are buzzing, that are, we're talking about them and we're sharing our favorite apps with friends. But unlike the App Store, these apps will not be siloed from one another. They will be collaborating. You can imagine um, having a photo you love on Instagram and getting, beginning to get millions of views and using a completely different app to begin monetizing that and making money off of that. You could imagine using a completely different uh, app to then publish that and make a book about that and send it to people's coffee table. You know, all of these things have to, in the future of app development, be interoperable. And there's no incentive today for interoperability. There's no um, foundation for interoperability. And frankly, there's no, as we said before, uh, protocol for user-owned data that helps the small developer compete on interface with the large developer. So yes, we're making the protocol, but we also want to make sure that the first you know, million users on the platform also feel very at home as developers begin to bring that totally new innovative concept uh, to the marketplace. Well, I think we wanted to invite people to the website, fabrk.io, to our events on the 4th, the 5th, and the 22nd, to other events in between, and to mm -hmm. other announcements, and really to, um, we love the support, we love the advice and the feedback, we love the questions, the easy questions and the hard questions, and so we want people to be in touch with us um, in order to foster this type of relationship, because as we said earlier, um, we see Korea as really an incredibly forward-thinking crypto and blockchain community and we want to be the beneficiaries, the partners and the collaborators for such, um, such a community. Yeah, uh, I would just reiterate that we're very excited to be here. Um, we're excited to be in this community and we're excited to sort of try to be stewards of the community and the ecosystem, especially making a bridge between the Korean market and the US market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have friends and we have relationships and we have partners uh, that are US based in the blockchain community. And we're really excited to help introduce them to the Korean market as well. And so, vice versa, yeah. And vice versa. And so we're, we're sort of happy to uh, be involved in the community and try to be real uh, caretakers and good stewards and create relationships. Yeah, we've been very lucky. We've gotten really great relationships throughout Asia in the finance side and in the tech side. And we already have really great relationships in the finance and tech side around Silicon Valley, San Francisco, and you know, Cambridge, MIT, Harvard. So now as we see other projects and meet so many really exciting teams, we want to make sure that as we kind of get closer and closer to our, our bigger events, um, that, that we also take others along with us who are just starting their journey. It's been an incredible journey for us and we would love to share the excitement with many others in this space.